Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Jeff Beach. I'm a professor of material science and engineering and also chair of our departmental committee on undergraduate studies. And it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here this afternoon for our 2017 Fall John Wolfe Lecture. So before I introduce our, our speaker, I want to say a few words about John Wolfe and about why we are here today. So this lecture is targeted primarily at, at students, primarily at freshmen, to try to introduce you to materials science and engineering and give you some of the background of what we try to do, why we try to do it, and some of the personalities that are involved in making this field and making this department what it really is. So John Wolfe is, is shown here. John Wolfe was a professor in our predecessor, the Department of Metallurgy, from 1937 until his retirement in 1973. He was a re remarkable researcher and scholar, but some of his most long-lasting achievements are in education. He really helped to define the modern material science curriculum, how we teach it, and how we understand it. So he had a long and illustrious career in teaching. Uh, in 1968, he developed uh, 3091. How many of you have taken 3091? Great. How many of you are in it right now? <laughs> so you can thank you can thank John Wolf. Jeff. Said it. Jeff. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> there we go. There we go. There we go. Okay, we don't have to sell you on material science and engineering. So this this was and still is a tremendously popular introduction to freshman chemistry. And John Wolfe was a riveting lecturer. So you can see him here. This was before the advent of high-speed photography. So in these times, it was very difficult to capture the degree of energy that he brought to his lectures. You can see his waving hands here. Uh, he, was, he was remarkable in, in his field. He and colleagues developed a set of textbooks. So this was back when we taught using textbooks. A set of textbooks called The Structure and Property of Materials. And this really defined the modern pedagogy of, of material science as we, as we know it. And I'll describe a bit of that to you in, in a moment. Um, so what do, we, what do we do? And as, as freshmen, particularly only in 3091, you're understanding a bit more about material science and engineering. But material science and engineering, among all the engineering disciplines, is argu arguably the most fundamental of disciplines. So many of you coming in know what electrical engineering is, and you know what electrical engineers build. You know what mechanical engineering is, and you know what mechanical engineers build, aerospace engineering and so forth. But underlying all of these different engineering disciplines is the materials that these engineers use to build what it is that they're trying to build, or really to solve the problem that they're trying to solve. And the limitations of what we can do in these disciplines is by and large controlled with the properties of the materials that make up the solutions both the limitations but also the opportunities derived from the properties of these materials that we can engineer. Material science and engineering is built on several pillars, and it's shown here on the left. And we take both approaches. You'll notice that, that our discipline, as opposed to most, includes both science and engineering. And this is shown in this pillar. We really try to understand the relation between processing of materials, structure, properties, and society. And what that means, there are a variety of ways to make materials to build materials from the atomic scale up, how we treat these materials, how we process them, gives rise to their structure. It gives rise to their atomic structure, their molecular and chemical structure, and it gives rise to larger range structure as well, grain sizes and mesoscale and so forth. This structure is what's behind the properties of materials, whether the mechanical properties, electronic properties, or, or what have you. Understanding the relation between how Processing gives these structural properties, and then finally how the structure, structure determines the properties of these materials is what we try to do from a fundamental perspective. And we don't stop there. We are driven by societal problems. Many of the problems that are facing humanity, whether they be energy, biotechnology, health, sustainability, are limited by what we can do with materials. And if we had materials that could do what we need them to do, we could solve many of these problems. In our department, in our field, we're driven by these big problems. So coming from the top down, we try to identify what are the big problems, what are the solutions that we need, what are the kinds of materials that we would need to give the properties that would solve some of these problems in energy and health and so forth. And once we know those properties, then we can go in the reverse direction. What is the structure of the material from the atomic scale up that would give rise to those properties, and then how do we produce these properties? And while we use many of the basic tenets of physics and chemistry and biology and so forth, we put all of these together so that we can understand these from the top down and from the bottom up. 
So the lecture today is to try to describe some of these concepts to you uh, from a particular example that Professor Gibson will describe. She follows in, in a long string of remarkable Wolf lectures. And the first Wolf lecture, of course, had to be John Wolf in 1977. And I think you will be equally impressed uh, today. So let me say a few words about our speaker. So Professor Lorna Gibson is a, a professor in our department in material science and engineering. She is the Matula Salopidus Professor of Material Science and Engineering, and she studies mechanical behavior of, of materials. So some of the most remarkable materials engineering that occurs is that done by nature. And Professor Gibson's research tries to identify and understand that, and then apply it to pressing problems. So she specializes in materials with cellular structure, such as engineering honeycombs and foams. And she uses this to build scaffolding, both in the macro scale, but also scaffolding that allows, for example, the attachment of, of bone or the regrowth of bone, so medical implants. So it's had a remarkable impact uh, on things. She's an inspired instructor. She's had many of the most important awards, teaching awards at MIT. She's a McVicker Fellow. She's uh, received the School of Engineering Bose Award for Excellence in Teaching. And quite recently, she re uh, received the Office of Digital Learning at, uh, Teaching with Digital Learning Award. And she's, of course, as many of you know, a pioneer in digital education through her courses on MITx. She's also a dedicated bird watcher. And so she's applied this academic background and a good dose of curiosity to figure out answers to perplexing questions, like why woodpeckers don't get concussions. Don't try that experiment at, at home. <laughs> so if you haven't seen her web series, uh, Born to Peck, please don't deprive yourself any longer, but wait, wait until the end of the, the lecture. So today, she will give us a materials and structural explanation of feathers. So please join me in welcoming Professor Gibson. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. So I'd like to talk today about feathers. And this really combines my interest in material science, but also my interest in bird watching. So I call this fantastic feathers form and function. And the form is the structure of the feathers, and the function is their properties. So we're going to look at various feathers and look at the structure and the properties of the feathers. So when we think about birds, we think about their feathers. The feathers provide the color for the birds, say the red of the scarlet tanager or the blue of the blue jay. The, the feathers provide iridescence in some feathers in, say, starlings or hummingbirds. And so the, the feathers really give the color to the birds. And all of these birds you can see around New England. Uh, they're all around here in the summertime. Feathers keep birds warm and dry. So if you think of an eider duck, here's a common eider on the left. Uh, the down in the eider duck keeps the bird warm so that it can, it can survive in the winter. If you go to Cape Ann in the winter, uh, you can see lots and lots of these eider ducks off in the, in the ocean. And you know the ocean's going to be, what, like 3 or 4 degrees Celsius, or Fahrenheit, 3, 3 or 4 degrees Celsius, something like that. So that the down keeps the birds warm. And you might have heard the expression, water rolling off a duck's back. And, and the water really does roll off the duck's back. You can kind of see in this picture here, it's just sheets of water are coming off the duck's back. And it's the structure of the feathers that, that is responsible for that. So we'll look at that again today. The feathers also provide the surface, the aerodynamic surface for flight. So the flight feathers have to be stiff and strong enough so that the birds can fly and, and maintain that aerodynamic shape uh, to get enough lift to, uh, to fly. And somewhat surprisingly, feathers are involved with sound. So some birds actually create sound with their feathers. This guy on the top, the club-winged mannequin up here, uh, that's a male club-winged mannequin. And the thing he's doing is he's, he's putting his feathers back together behind him like this. And he's beating his feathers together. And that makes a high-pitched noise. It makes this kind of noise. And apparently, the females find that incredibly attractive. <laughs> so, so in fact, the males compete on the basis of who can make the best noise with their wings. And, um, and they make this sound. So they use their feathers to generate the sound. Some birds use feathers to suppress sound. It's well known that some owls can fly virtually silently. And they do that with uh, little structures that are on their, on their flight feathers. And uh, barn owls actually collect sound with their feathers. So when you look at the ruff of a barn owl, you see the, the face here, this thing here around the outside of the face is called the ruff. The feathers in the ruff actually collect sound and direct the sound towards their ears. And that helps them hunt at night when they can't really see very much. So I'll talk a little. I'm not going to be able to talk about all these things, but I'll, I'll talk about some of them. 
So this is me. This is me in MIT mode here, giving us some kind of a talk. And then that's also me birding in the Adirondacks uh, at Black Pond near Paul Smith's in the Adirondacks. And I think on that day, we were watching loons, and they were baby loons. And so I, I like to do material science, but I also like to go out and go birding when I get the chance. So birds are wonderful. So as, as Jeff said, in material science, we're really interested in the relationship between processing of materials and how the processing affects the structure, say the atomic structure, the molecular bonding, uh, the microstructure, and then how the structure affects the properties, things like mechanical properties or electronic properties, and then also how the properties are used in the performance of the material in an engineering application. And then we're, the, the tetrahedron here shows the interrelationship between all those things. And then we also do characterization, which is, again, related to all of these things. So we're interested in processing, structure, properties, and performance, and how we characterize materials. And so, for example, if you think of carbon fiber composites, you could process the composites to have unidirectional aligned fibers, or you could process them to have chopped up random fibers. And those two materials would have different structures and then would have different properties based on that structure and would perform differently in engineering applications. So it's really this processing, structure, properties, and performance, and as Jeff said, society. And what I've been interested in my career has been structure-property relationships. So a lot of us work on structure-property relationships. And probably the first person to think about structure-property relationships in materials is Robert Hooke. So you may be familiar with Robert Hooke from Hooke's Law with the springs. You know, you put a load on the spring, it gets a little longer, you double the load, it gets twice as, the extension gets twice as big. Well, Robert Hooke did many other things, and one of the other things he did was he wrote a book called Micrographia in 1665, and what he did was he got an early microscope, and he put lots of different materials under the microscope, and he was an artist as well as a scientist, and he made these beautiful drawings, and then he wrote a paragraph or two about each thing. And it turns out one of the things he looked at was cork, and the reason I wanted to show you this was because he has this beautiful quote here about, about the structure of cork. And he says, I no sooner discerned these, which were the first microscopical pores I ever saw, but methought that I had with the discovery of them presently hinted to me the true and intelligible reason for all the phenomena of cork. So what he's really saying is here, he's, he looks at this structure, and he can understand something about the properties of the cork based on the structure. And you can kind of imagine, you know, cork has that sort of spongy feel. It's a little soft. And when you look at this, you see it's all porous. So it's not surprising that if it's porous, it would give you this kind of so soft, compliant kind of behavior. So he has this nice quote about structure-property relationships. He also looked at feathers. And this is Robert Hooke's drawing of feathers uh, from his book from 1665. And here's the, this is the, the shaft of the feather here. This is the vein. And this is sort of at a higher magnification. This piece here is one of these pieces that comes off the vein. And then the smaller pieces come off that. And you can see he's drawn these little tiny hooks here. And then in the top, you can see the little tiny hooks up there. So th this is Robert Hooke's drawing of feathers. And you can see the structures at different length scales here. And what I'd like to talk about today is how are the properties of feathers related to their structure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about color, about thermal insulation, about how feathers make themselves water repellent, uh, the stiffness of the feathers, and how feathers collect sound in the barn owl's uh, rough. And I should say that this isn't really my own research. This really is a collection of of information that I've gathered from the literature. It's really a review of, of what's in the literature. So it's really other people's work that I'm talking about here. So first, we need to talk about the structure. And there's several different types of feathers. The, the feathers you're probably familiar with are the contour feathers. Those are the feathers on the outside of the bird. So this is a contour feather here. This would be a flight feather on the wing. There's also down. So if you have down pillows or a down jacket, you're familiar with little bits of down coming out. There's a few other types of feathers here, uh, the semi-plumes are within the, with the body. And these phyloplumes and bristles are partly used as sensors for the bird. So they can sense where the, the phyloplumes sense where the feathers are and the position of the flight feathers. And the bristles um, act as sensors uh, for helping the birds to catch insects. They're typically on, on their face, the, the bristles. So there's these different types of feathers. And then if we look at the contour feather, you can see the structure. This is from a, a standard ornithology textbook. So here's a sketch of the feather. Uh, the shaft is called the rachis. And the little bits that come off are called the barb. So I have a, I have a large feather. I think this is a, maybe a turkey feather. So here's the shaft. And these are the barbs that come off that you can see here. And then there's also smaller pieces come off of that um, called barbules. And here you can see the little hooks. And if you look at this picture here, the hooks on one side of the barb hook into little grooves on the adjacent side of the next um, barb. 
And so the, the way those hooks and grooves fit together, that's what maintains the, the sort of shape of, of the vein. Those hooks and grooves kind of form the shape of it. And here's some scanning electron micrographs that we took. Isaac Cabrera was a Europe student who worked with me on this. So many of these micrographs were taken by Isaac. He did a great job. He was a wonderful Europe student. These are mallard uh, primary flight feathers. Uh, so here again is the shaft, the rachis. And you can see the barbs, the shaft of the barb there. And then the, here's the little barbules here. And if you take a cross section, you can see this is the shaft here. And it's, it's sort of a, a tubular structure on the outside. And it's got kind of a foamy structure on the inside. And this is the shaft of the barbs. And then the, the vein is up here. And this is a higher magnification picture. Again, you can see the vein here. Here's the little grooves. There's a couple of little hooks. And this is the picture that was on the poster for the talk. And it's, it's one barb. And you can see the little um, barbules with the hooklets on one side and with, with the grooves on the other. So that's kind of the structure of a typical flight feather in a bird. And you can see from the scale markers what the, the scale of some of these features are. They're tens of microns or even single microns. Uh, just for comparison, a human hair is about 50 microns. And when you think of the feathers, they grow out of a follicle the same way as your hair grows out of a follicle. So all of this structure is growing out of a follicle the same as, the same as your hair grows out of a follicle. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about down. So here's the structure of down. Here's our little eider duck swimming along. And here's a single down feather. If we look at that in the microscope, uh, this is one of the barbs. And these are the barbules. So you can see it's got a very different structure. It's much less organized than the contour feathers. But one of the interesting things is these barbules have little, little um, sort of projections on them that are called nodal prongs. And it's thought that that helps to keep the barbules separated so that they trap air. And trapping air is important for the, the thermal insulation of the feather. So that's the structure of the down. And I was, I was kind of amused by this. Uh, if you read bird, bird ornithology textbooks, one of the things they quote is how many feathers a bird has. And in the 1930s, remember during the Depression, the Works Progress Administration, one of their make work projects was to get people to count the number of feathers on birds. <laughs> so you know, ornithologists were hiring people to count the number of feathers. And it turns out that a robin has about 2,500 feathers on it. And a, <laughs> a ruby-throated hummingbird has about 1,000. And a tundra swan has about 25,000. More recently, just a few years ago, some people looked at emperor penguins. They, instead of counting all the feathers, they just took a small sample and then you know, extrapolated for the surface area of the bird. But man, do they have a lot of feathers, like really. You know, 135,000 feathers, that's a lot, of, a lot of feathers. OK, so I want to talk about the different properties. And let, let me start with the color. So as I mentioned, these are all birds that you can see in New England. Some of the color is from pigment. So you know, when you paint the wall of your apartment or your room, uh, the paint has pigment in it, and that reflects light of a certain color. But some of the color is structural color, and the iridescence is a structural color. So I want to talk about both pigmented color and, and structural color in birds. So just to remind you, color is light of different wavelengths. And this shows the visible spectrum. So the, the light that we can see has wavelengths between about 400 and 700 nanometers. Uh, somewhat interestingly, birds can see ultraviolet light as well. They have a different cone in their eyes, and they can see, actually see ultraviolet that we can't see. So uh, hundreds of nanometers is the wavelength of light. And if we think about pigment in feathers, there's lots of different pigments that give different colors. So one that you're probably familiar with is melanin. That's a black hair has melanin pigment in it. And blacks and grays are formed by a pigment called eumelanin. So here's a little herring gull. You know, if there's a lot of the, the melanin and it's highly concentrated, you get black. If it's less concentrated and sort of distributed, you get grays. There's also a phyomelanin that gives you a sort of reddish brown. This is a cinnamon teal. You can see those out west in the States. There's carotenoid pigments that give you reds and yellows. So the scarlet tanager would have carotenoid uh, here. And the, the red-eyed vireo would have the yellow over here. And owls often have this porphyrin pigment that gives you a rusty red or brown. So these pigments act just like any kind of pigment. They absorb white light, and they're which is composed of all the wavelengths. And then they emit and reflect a particular color. So the most common type of color in, in birds is from pigments. But some birds have structural color as well. And some birds have iridescent feathers, and that really is a structural color. So this slide here just shows some different uh, natural examples of, of iridescence, as, as well as oil on water. So this is a hummingbird, and you can see the feathers on the throat are iridescent. Lots of butterflies and moths have iridescent uh, wings. Uh, it's very common for beetle uh, cuticles, the shell, to be uh, iridescent. And then this is just oil on water. 
Um, and so the structural colors are a re result of some structural feature in the material, and that feature has to be of a similar size to the wavelength of light. So here's the ruby-throated hummingbird. One of the characteristics of iridescence is that the color changes with the viewing angle. And you can see here, when you see the ruby-throated hummingbird dead on, it, it does look ruby-throated. It's got this red. But when it turns around, it's the same species of bird. It, it looks sort of a greenish-black color. So the color that you see depends on the viewing angle. And that's, typical, uh, that's a typical characteristic of iridescence. One of the things I like about, uh, about the word iridescence is it comes from the Greek god Iris. And Iris was the personification of the rainbow. So it seems appropriate that if the color changes with the viewing angle and you get different colors, iridescence is based on the, the god for the rainbow. And ir Iris was also the link between the gods and the natural world. So one thing we need to understand to understand iridescence is waves that are out of phase and in phase. And I, I suspect most of you are aware of this. If you have waves where the, the troughs and the peaks um, are opposite to each other, then the waves are out of phase and you get destructive interference. So if you have a wave A here where the, it goes down at first and B goes up at first, those two are going to cancel out and give you nothing. If you have waves where the troughs and the valleys match up perfectly, you're going to get constructive interference and you get a, a resulting wave with the same wavelength but a bigger amplitude. So I wanted to explain iridescence by talking about oil on water, and then we'll look at the bird feathers and see how the bird feathers work. So if you think about a thin layer of oil on water, and say light is coming in, so say white light of all wavelengths comes in, some of the light is going to reflect off the interface between the air and the oil. So that light is going to go over here. But some of the light is going to go through the oil layer, and it's, some of it will bounce off of the interface between the oil and the water, so it'll go up through this path here. And then it'll come up on this path over here. And most of the wavelengths for the light that went on this path and the light that went on that path, most of those wavelengths are going to be out of phase, and they're going to cancel out, and you're not going to see anything from that. But some of the wavelengths, there's going to be a small number of wavelengths where the wavelength of this uh, reflected light plus the wavelength of that reflected light is going to add up, and you're going to get um, uh, constructive interference. And that's the wavelength of light that you'll see. So why does the color depend on the viewing angle? Well, I've, I've taken this image here, and I've just sort of smushed it sideways. I've contracted it uh, from left to right. And you can see that when you do that, this viewing angle here changes. That angle is different. But also this distance ABC here, when we're looking at a different angle, that distance ABC is different. And because that distance is different, there's going to be a different wavelength that is interacting constructively. And so you're going to see a different color. So when you have a system here where you've got different surfaces and the light is uh, reflecting off these different surfaces, you can get iridescent type uh, behavior in, in the color. So this is how it works in birds. This is the satin bower bird. It lives in Australia, in Queensland. And they're quite beautiful. They have this sort of iridescent, bluey, purpley kind of feathers. And in this study here, they took uh, the, the rump feathers. So here's the feathers themselves. And here's a scanning electron micrograph of the structure of the feathers. So here's, you know, here's the barb here and the little barbules coming off. And then they took a cross section of the barbule. So this is now five microns. And this is what the barbule looks like. And these little black dots are all melanin pigment. And then they looked at even higher magnification. So the little black dots are all the melanin pigment. And at the very top, there's a layer of keratin, which is what the feathers are made from, which doesn't have any pigment in it. And that's transparent. So that transparent layer of keratin there corresponds to the oil layer in the oil on water example. And here you've got a highly aligned layer of melanin granules, and that behaves like the water layer. So if I magnify that up a bit, that last image, you can see here's the transparent keratin layer up here, and here's this aligned layer of melanin pigment. And <clears throat> it works the same way as the oil on water. Some of the light reflects off the surface between the air and the, melan and the uh, keratin, and some goes through the keratin and bounces off the melanin layer. And there's going to be some of those wavelengths are going to add constructively, and that's the color of the light that you're going to see. And the thing that I found really amazing about this was just how thin that keratin layer is. It's, it's 163 nanometers. So when you think of this, the bird is making this structure from a follicle, like our hair follicle. And it's making these structures. And to make this work, you have to have a thin layer of the transparent keratin. In this case, it's 163 nanometers. 
But you also have to have the melanin pigment lining up in a fairly aligned way, because you want to keep the, lay the thickness of that transparent layer more or less constant. So you need the melanin to be highly organized as well. So it's kind of stunning that the feathers have this structure on the order of hundreds of nanometers. Now this is another example. This is the shiny cowbird. And here's the cross section of one of its barbs. It works the same kind of way. You can see this, the little black dots here are the melanin layer. And again, it's, it's quite aligned. And there's a thin, transparent layer of keratin uh, just above that, so it works the same way. And in this case, the transparent outer layer of keratin is 84 nanometers thick. It's even, even thinner. And this is another type of hummingbird called the black-chinned hummingbird. And you can see it's got an even fancier structure. So this, again, is the cross-section of a barbule. But it's got these little kind of almost plate-like pieces with melanin lined up in the middle of each plate. And it's got multiple layers of the melanin. So the light must be going, you know, reflecting off these different layers and reaching down into the depth of it uh, to different extents and reflecting off them. And I think that's why the hummingbirds have this really spectacular kind of iridescence that you can see. So it's really these structures on the sort of hundreds of nanometer length scale that give rise to the iridescence in the, in the bird feathers. So that's the color and the structural color. Next, I wanted to talk about thermal insulation and how the feathers insulate the birds. So there's, there's a number of birds that live in either the Arctic or the Antarctic. The snowy owls live in the Arctic, and the emperor penguin lives in the Antarctic. And they manage to survive, even though the temperatures get very cold, and it's, it's uh, very low temperature in the Antarctic and the Arctic. And some of these birds stay there all winter long. Some snowy owls stay in the Arctic all winter long, and, and emperor penguins stay in the Antarctic year round. So they, they manage this by the insulation of their down. And these are some birds that live in New England and stay in New England in the winter. So if you have a feeder out in your backyard, you would see cardinals or black-capped chickadee. The black-capped chickadee is the state bird of Massachusetts. And these birds stay here, too. And one of the things that allows them to stay is that they'll eat seeds and they can find things to eat. The, things that, the thing that drives birds to migrate isn't the cold. It's whether or not they can get food. So any bird that eats, say, just insects, so warblers typically eat mostly insects, or swifts and swallows eat insects, if you eat insects and there's no insects in the winter, you've got to leave. So the thing that makes them leave is really whether or not they can get something to eat. It's not really the cold. So it turns out that their, their down is enough to keep them warm, and they, they can keep warm. So this is a comparison between, um, between eider down. So this is a piece of down and the structure of the down, and a polyurethane foam that might be used for insulation. So here's the foam, and here's what the cell structure looks like. And one of the things to notice is even though the structures look, look a bit different, the down is about 1% solid and 99% air. And the spacing of the barbules, those little fibers there, is about 100 microns or a tenth of a millimeter. And if you look at the foam, it's about 3% solid and 97% air. And the pore size on the foam is about a quarter of a millimeter. So there's some similarity in the amount of air and the, the size of the spacing between the elements. Um, just a little kind of review of heat flow and how heat flows through materials. Heat can flow by conduction. So if you stick a steel rod into a fire, it gets hot by conduction. Uh, heat can flow by convection. Hot air rises just due to density differences. So here's the convection. And heat can flow by radiation as well. So we'll look at each of those and how it works in the feathers and, and also in the foams. So if we think about thermal conductivity, thermal conductivity is a property of the material. And here's uh, the thermal conductivity of a range of materials. Here's air. It's about 0.025 in these units of watts per meter K. Keratin is the feather material. It's about 0.2. Polyurethane is similar, about 0.25. Water is about 0.6. That's why you get cold if, you're, if you get wet. It's got a higher uh, conductivity than air. And copper is something like 400. So there's a huge difference in range here. So air is actually a pretty good thermal insulator. It does not conduct heat very well. And if you look at the down feathers, they're about 99% air. So that if they're 99% air and the air has a low conductivity, that's going to help insulate the bird. And then they're about 1% of the solid keratin. So just having a lot of air uh, trapped in the down, and partly it's trapped by those nodal prongs I showed before, that really helps reduce the conduction and increase the insulation. If we look at the other mechanisms, and, and one way to think about it is to look at how it works in foams, if you think of uh, heat flow in foams, you can have heat flow by convection. So the warm air is going to rise, the cool air is going to flow, uh, fall. And you would get a convection current set up. But it turns out that there's also friction between the airflow and the walls of the cells. And because there's air there's, uh, airflow along the wall, you get some friction. And if the pore size is small, the friction suppresses convection in foams. And it turns out if the, cell, if the pore size is less than a few millimeters, you can suppress the convection. So in foams, convection is not very important. 
And if you think about heat flow by radiation in foam, say you had a hot side over here, a hot temperature over there, and a cold temperature over there, at each of these cell walls, the radiant heat is going to be, some of it's going to be absorbed and reflected. So the smaller the pores, the more times the heat's absorbed and the less heat is tr transmitted. So the small cell size tends to reduce the heat flow from radiation. And so similarly in the birds, in the feathers, uh, in the down, the conduction is reduced by having a high volume fraction of low conductivity air, and the convection and radiation are reduced by the small spacing of the barbules. So the structure of the down is partly responsible for the low thermal conductivity and the high insulation value. We can do a few little sort of back of the envelope type calculations. The conduction through the air is just the conductivity of the air times how much air we've got, so it would be this number here. The conduction through the keratin is the conductivity of the keratin times how much keratin, about 1%. And this is just sort of an efficiency factor to account for the fact that the keratin's not totally straight fibers running from one side to the other. Um, there's been measurements made of the radiation heat transfer in down, and it's in this range here. And then the overall conductivity of the down is just the sum of those three numbers, so I've added them up here. And the sum of those adds up to about 0 .0 0 0.036 watts per meter K, and people have measured values in the range of about 0.03 to 0.045. So that sort of simple calculation seems to be at least in the right ballpark. And other things birds do to reduce their, their heat flow and to stay warm is they, they do this fluffing up routine. So I have a friend, Alison Curtis, who lives up in northern Ontario, and she has a little feeder. And this is a picture she took. And you can see the chickadee is all kind of, his body's almost spherical. He sort of fluffed his feathers out so much. And when they do that, they're really trapping more air in their feathers. And they're also making themselves more spherical. And, and the sphere has the lowest surface area per unit volume. So you've got less sort of surface area for the heat to flow out of. So they do this cute little kind of fluffing up routine as well. So the thermal conductivity of the feathers and the insulation value of the down is, is uh, controlled in part by the structure of the down. The next thing I wanted to talk about was water repellency and how the water flows off the duck's back. So here's our little duck. Um, birds have something called a preen gland, and it's at the base of their tail. And you sometimes see birds kind of with their beaks kind of scratching around at the base of their tail. And this is a crossbill, and it looks kind of weird, but this is its beak here, and it's trying to get at the preen gland there. And the preen gland has oil in it, and then it rubs its beak over the feathers and, and sort of uh, preens them with the, with the oil. And for a long time, ornithologists thought that it was this preen gland oil that made their feathers water repellent. But it turns out other people have taken the feathers and they've cleaned all the oil off. And it turns out they're still water repellent even if you clean them all off. So what, what is it that makes them repel water and makes them hydro, hydrophobic? One way we characterize how hydrophobic a material is is we measure the contact angle. So the contact angle is a measure of the spreading of the water on the surface. So this is just a piece of glass down here, and that's a little water drop. And the contact angle is just the angle between the surface and the tangent to the outer edge of the drop. So for this water on glass, the contact angle is around 14 degrees. Uh, here's some other examples. Here's the glass. This is water on wax. The contact angle is around 100 degrees. And this is a, a, a Canada goose feather shaft, and the water droplet sits like that. And the contact angle is around 90 degrees. So the larger the contact angle is, the more the water beads up, and the more water repellent the material is, the more hydrophobic it is. So these images here were just taken with my iPhone on my kitchen counter. Um, it turns out there's a more sophisticated way to measure contact angle. So we have a goniometer in the department, and Isaac, the Europe student, um, did some measurements with Gita Barrera. So uh, it's just hard to see the drop here, so that's why I use the other ones as well. So here's some measurements of the contact angle for glass. Water on glass is about 7 degrees. Water on paraffin is about 109. And on a Canada goose shaft, it's about 102. So, so you can see um, partly these different surfaces, these different materials have a different um, contact angle and a different amount of hydrophobicity. So what is it about the material, what, about, what is it about the surface that makes them have different materials have different contact angles? And it turns out materials have a surface energy. So imagine that you've got a nice little crystalline material here. If you're an atom in the bulk of the material, you're going to see bonds in all directions out here. But if you're an atom on the surface, you're going to see just bonds in some directions. There are no atoms on top of you. And so there's going to be some unbalanced bonds there. And there's a surface energy associated with that. You know, another way to think about this is if you have a material and you break it into two pieces, you form new surfaces, and it requires some energy to form those new surfaces. So materials have a surface energy, and materials that are more strongly bonded tend to have higher surface energies than ones that are more weakly bonded. So here, here's our example of the 
water on glass and the water on wax again. So the, the water is going to take up a shape that minimizes that surface energy. The surface energy of the glass is around 3 joules per meter squared. The surface energy of the water is about 0.072 joules per meter squared. So to minimize the surface energy, you want to have less glass and more water. So you want the water to spread out on the glass. On the wax, the water has a slightly higher surface energy. And so you want, you know, oops, sorry. So the water is going to uh, bead up more and try to minimize the amount of, of surface area there. So this contact angle is a measure of the, um, how water repellent the surface is, and it depends on the surface energy of the material. So in part, the feathers get their water repellency from the surface energy of the keratin, but it turns out that's not the whole story. Uh, in World War II, there were two scientists, Cassie and Baxter, who were interested in military greatcoats. They were interested in those British wool military greatcoats, and they wanted to make them more water repellent. And they realized that wool that these coats were made of was made up of fibers. They worked at the Wool Industries Research Association, which I think is an incredibly English kind of place to work. Um, <laughs> so anyway, they were trying to, look at, trying to make it the, these wool greatcoats more water repellent. And the thing they realized was that if you have just a solid surface, you're going to get a certain contact angle. But if you have parallel fibers, you might get a different contact angle. And what they realized was that the water droplet might bridge between two fibers. So imagine these are like parallel fibers. And they calculated an apparent contact angle for an array of parallel fibers. And they did that based on these surface energies. And they found that you could increase the contact angle if you got just the right spacing and diameter of those fibers. And then they went on in the same paper they went on and looked at duck feathers. And they measured for these, I think they measured the barbules, they measured the radius, and they measured the spacing. And um, there's a, a sort of, this is a simplified version of their uh, equation for the apparent contact angle based on the flat surface having a contact angle of 90 degrees. And they found that for typical values of this sort of radius and spacing of the feather barbules, for the typical values here, you could increase the contact angle quite significantly. So if you started at 90 for a flat surf, solid surface, you could get you know, something like 140 or 150, which is a very high, very hydrophobic material. And this is some images here that just shows this. So this is our picture of the water droplet on the Canada Goose shaft. And you get an angle of around 90 degrees. So that's just from the surface energy of the shaft itself. But this is a water droplet on a pigeon feather. And this angle here is closer to 140 degrees. And you can see how the water beads up on that. And it's really controlled by the spacing and the radius of these, of these barbules and barbs. So they, they measured, this is a study by Boroshemko and his group. Uh, and they measured these much higher contact angles. And then, of course, I had to have Isaac do the same thing. So here's the contact angle on the shaft, about 102 degrees in the goniometer. And here's the same feather measuring the uh, contact angle on the vein. And it's about 142 degrees. So partly the hydrophobicity, the water repellency, comes from the keratin and the surface energy of the keratin. But it also comes from the arrangement of the fibers as well and the structure of those fibers. And Cassie and Baxter have this lovely quote in their paper. They say, it's sufficient to note that water rolls off a duck's back because of the structure of its feathers, rather than because of an exceptional proofing agent, and that man's attempt to make clothing with the water repellency of a duck should be directed to perfecting an appropriate cloth structure, rather than, as at present, searching for an improved water repellent agent. And I noticed today's a rainy day. And if you wore your Gore-Tex coat in today, uh, many of those Gore-Tex type fabrics have something called a durable water repellent coating on them. And that coating is, is based not quite on the, on the duct structure, but on sort of having an array of little pillars. But the, um, the analysis of the water repellency of that is based on the same Cassie Baxter kind of calculation. So people have engineered structures and engineered materials uh, that, that make use of this Cassie Baxter analysis to develop water repellent fabrics for clothing. Unfortunately, not in World War II, but they have managed to do it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about flight feathers and the stiffness of flight feathers. Um, when, a, when a bird's flying, the, the flight feathers bend and they twist as the bird maneuvers around. And if you've ever roasted a chicken, you can see in the skin there's little, like, little puckers where the feathers sort of are anchored in the skin. The flight feathers of birds are anchored in the bone, not in the skin. And this is a nice uh, example of a mallard wing. Here's the bones of the wing. This is the humerus, and, and this is the sort of hand bone here. And you can see how these flight feathers are anchored into that bone. So you need the, the flight feathers that you can see big loads in flying need to be anchored somehow. 
Here's some more images of the uh, flight feathers. So this is looking at the vein here. And I think the main point here I wanted to, to emphasize again is that the vein maintains its shape by having these little hooks on one side of the barb fit into the grooves on the other side of the adjacent barb. And so it's these really hooks and grooves that give the vein its, its integrity. And if you look at a flightless bird, like an emu, you can see that this is the, the rachis, the shaft on the emu, and these are the barbs and these are the barbules. And you, they don't have the hooks and they don't have the grooves. And it turns out if you don't fly, you don't need those. So, so the emu doesn't have those hooks and, and groove structures. This is a, a series of cross sections of the feather shaft. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the shape of the shaft and what makes it efficient for resisting loads from a mechanical sense and what makes it lightweight. So these are different sections cut along the length of the shaft, and then these are the cross sections corresponding to that. And you can see as you go from the base here to the tip, the, the size of the uh, cross section diminishes. And also, uh, you can see that we've got kind of a square tube of solid material on the outside here. And this white stuff on the inside is, is a foamy kind of keratin. And I'll, I'll show you some better pictures of that in a little bit. So, so one question is, why does the size increase from the tip to the base? Why is it a square tube? And, and why is it filled with foam? So if you think about the feather and how it's loaded, if you think of a sort of side view of the feather here, there's some pressure from the air that's causing the lift. Um, and then if you look at the top view, if you cut the feather right here, there'd be some outer area corresponding to this. And the force on the shaft at that point would just be the pressure times this little area here. If you cut it here, the force at that point on the shaft would be this area times the pressure, and so on. So as you go closer to the base of the feather, the forces increase on the feather, and the bending moments also increase. And that means that the stresses increase. And so you want to have a bigger cross section to resist those larger stresses as you get closer to the base of the feather. So why is it a square tube? Why not some other shape? And why is it filled with the foam? Well, if you think about it, a square tube, um, it turns out the bending stresses and deflections depend on the moment of inertia. So I know some of you have taken 1801, and I know you talk about moments of inertia. And for a, for a cross section, the moment of inertia is the integral of y squared dA. So say we measure y from the middle and go up there. So if we have a lot of material with a big y, we have a big moment of inertia. And that means that for a given weight, you've got a, a bigger moment of inertia than if you just had, say, a solid cross section. So by having this square tube, you've got a bigger moment of inertia for a given mass than, than if you had a, um, a solid section. So this is a way of the feather reducing the weight for some given mechanical requirement. And similarly, for, for torsional loading, for twisting, the deformations and the stresses depend on the polar moment of inertia, and it's a similar thing. Putting material on the outside of the structure um, helps do that. So the square tube is efficient mechanically in terms of resisting loads at a low weight. And then why is the shaft filled with foam? Well, you could just have a hollow tube. And if you have a hollow tube, think of having a drinking straw. If you bend a drinking straw, you can get that kind of kinking kind of failure. If you put foam in the middle, it helps to prevent that kind of kinking failure. And this is very common in natural structures. You see this in grasses. Uh, you see it in porcupine quills. You see it in a lot of natural structures. And this is a better micrograph showing the foam. So the foam helps increase the load to cause kinking, and also it provides some thermal insulation and prevents some heat loss. So this is sort of a, um, uh, you know, I wanted to explain why the, why the cross section changes in size from the tip to the base, why it's square, and why it's a foam-filled tube. And all of these things really have a mechanical reason for them. The last thing I wanted to talk about is how owls use their ruff to collect sound. So the, the ruff is this, is this outer sort of dark brown uh, feathers that are out here. And here's our little barn owl. You can see barn owls around, around New England. So people have done various experiments with the barn owls. For some reason, they focus on barn owls. One experiment they've done is they take a totally blackened room. And I didn't make this totally black because it'd be nothing to see. It'd just be a black box. But imagine there's no light at all. They've blackened out all of the light. They then put dead leaves on the floor of the room. They then put a little owl on a perch in the room. And then they, they release some little unsuspecting mouse into the dead leaves. And yeah, you can imagine what happens. This is what happens. <laughs> so owls can catch things in total darkness. They can catch little voles under the snow. They, they don't have to see things to catch them. And they do it all by their hearing. So what is it about their hearing? Well, there's a, there's a few things that are, that are different in owls. So owl skulls are asymmetric. So here's a long 
a long-eared owl skull. Here's one side here. You can see that is different from this side here. And it turns out owls' ears are at different heights on their skulls. So that the, the owl, I don't know exactly where the ear is, but it fits into here somewhere. And their ears are at different heights on their skull. This is a whole skull, a northern solid owl. And you can see the skull is asymmetrical. And again, it's got ears at different heights. Oops, sorry, I must have hit the wrong button. And barn owls also have the left ear is higher than the right ear. So one thing that's different is their ears are at different heights on their skulls. Turns out that's not the only difference. Uh, they also have a difference in these rough feathers. So if I took a feather from the top of the head that's not on the ruff, it would look like that, just a regular contour feather. These white feathers inside the ruff are called auricular feathers, and all the little circles are just some artifact on the stub that the feather's on. Uh, but you can see the spacing of the barbs here is very big on these um, auricular feathers, and the barbules aren't very long. So they're sort of almost transparent to sound. And the idea is the sound is transmitted through those auricular feathers. And then the feathers on the outside here of the ruff, the sort of darker brown ones, those are called reflector feathers. And you can see here the, the barbs and the barbules are tack, packed very tightly, and those actually do reflect the sound. Uh, these are similar pictures, just at a slightly higher magnification. So the, you know, the sound is, transmits through these ones and reflects at those ones. And it turns out these rough feathers are also asymmetrical. So on the right side, the feathers are more upward facing, and they preferentially focus sound from above into the right ear. And on the left side, the, the rough feathers are more downward facing, and they focus sound from below into the left ear. And people have done yet more experiments on the little barn owls. They put little like mini earphones on the owls. And if you, if you play sound louder in the left ear, it looks down. And if you play sound louder in the right ear, it looks up. And if you remove the rough feathers, then they have difficulty identifying where the sound comes from. So it's not just that their ears are at different heights, that the feathers direct, that the feathers too are asymmetric, and they direct sound into the, into the two ears differently. So I wanted to finish by just summarizing some of these structure property relationships for the feathers. Um, we can think of the feathers at different length scales. So at hundreds of millimeters, there's the length of the feather and the, the, the whole shaft length that, that is important for the stiffness of the feather. At the scale of tens of millimeters, there's the width of the vein that corresponds to the length of the barbs that also is important for the stiffness. At the length scale of sort of individual, one or two or three millimeters, there's the cross-sectional size of the shaft. That also affects the stiffness of the feather. We can look at the micron scale at hundreds of microns to tens of microns. There's the barb spacing and the barb radius that affects water repellency and the sound collection. At the scale of single microns, there's the hooks on the hooklets that you know, form the, the, the sort of surface of the vein. And then at the level of tenths of microns or hundreds of nanometers, there's the structural color uh, transparent keratin la layer that I mentioned at the beginning. And that gives rise to the iridescent color in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the birds. So this final slide just shows some of these different features. And, and I hope what you can take away from it is, is an understanding that the structure of the feathers gives rise to all these different properties. And sometimes when I give this talk for material scientists, I don't call it fantastic feathers form and function. I call it hierarchical structure and multifunctionality, because that seems like more of a <laughs> material science kind of title. So this just sort of summarizes these different structures. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge Isaac Cabrera. He was a fantastic EUROP student who took many of these images. Gita helped him with some of the contact angle measurements. Chris Shu, our department head, has been wonderfully supportive of my sort of idiosyncratic bird project. And Jeremiah Trimble is one of the curators at the ornithology department at Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology. When I want barn owl feathers, I talk to Jeremiah. I have many, I, I've, there's more I've got on feathers, but it wouldn't fit into an hour's talk, so I didn't put it in here. When I want desert sand grouse feathers, I go talk to, to Jeremiah. You know, when I want whatever kind of feathers, when I want barn owl skulls, when I want all these different bird things, Jeremiah lets me either borrow them or go up to the museum and take photographs of them. So I could not do this project without the Museum of Comparative Zoology. So that's my talk. I'd like to finish there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Gibson, for that yeah. outstanding talk. Although now I'm going to feel a little bit guilty eating my turkey in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, not that guilty. I'm still guilty. Yeah. <laughs> so we have, we have time for a few questions before we go out to a reception. Do we have any questions in the audience? Aren't birds amazing? The feathers are amazing. It's totally amazing. Jeff Grossman. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, and I'm sure no owls were harmed. That's what they say. But, so, uh, at least not at MIT. Um, As I said, I didn't do any of these experiments. I'm reporting what other people did. But my question actually is on the last one. How, did the, how does the, the, the other reflect the sound? What's the structure? So I think it's the, sh it's denser. it's denser, I think. Yeah, it's just like a dense, you know, it's solid. Not about the orientation. Well, I think it's both. It's denser, so it reflects the sound, but they're oriented differently on the two sides of the head, so that sound from, you know, one side reflects into, the sound from below reflects preferentially into one ear, and the sound from above reflects preferentially. So I think it's a combination of sort of the density of the barbs and the barbules, and then which way it's facing. Birds are amazing? Thanks for, for the Thanks are amazing. Why doesn't a I have a video on that. You can watch my video. <laughs> that was a plant. He's a plant. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Jennifer? Yeah, thank you very much for your question, Lana. So I was wondering about covers. Were some of the structures adapted to energy storage electrodes? Have are they adapted to yeah. energy storage? Yeah, so the structures that we have, I mean controlling the degree of movement, of expansion, many of the mechanics. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I haven't thought about that, but the you know the the feathers do have you know I didn't really talk about this, but they're most of the feathers are anchored in the skin, the flight feathers are anchored in the bone, but there's little muscles around them so they can control the position of the feathers. And I said there's those um, uh, what are they called phyloplumes that are like little sensors, so they're sort of adjacent to the flight feathers. And if a feather goes here, this guy moves a little bit, and there's a little sensor that kind of picks that up and says, "No, back over here." So they can control the sort of position of the feathers. So I, I don't quite know a good answer to your question, but but it, they can control the position of the feathers to some extent. And like I said, you know, the, the down they can kind of fluff up the feathers and make it hold more air. Yeah, we can talk more. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. You mentioned briefly that birds see into the UV. Yeah. So is there evidence of structures in birds that would provide, say, color in the UV? So people have actually studied this. Um, so we have cones in our eyes, and we have three cones. They're sort of a, a blue, green, red, if I got that right. I think that's right. And birds have a fourth one. They have this UV cone. And people have done studies where they use um, spectrometers, and they, they've put light on a feather, and then they measure the wavelengths of the light that are reflected. And, and they can, I, I'm pretty sure that they see light, you know, some of the light is reflected in, in the UV range. So you can, you can make measurements of this, but you know, we can't see it with our eyes. So if we could see UV, birds would be a lot more colorful. Well, I think there, there's certainly there's colors in the birds that they can see that we can't see. Yeah, yeah. Yes? The uh, application question is that, so we obviously see that the bird that is Well, you know, I mentioned the um, water repellent structures on, on fabric. That's one example. You know, looking at, I mean, these engineers have figured out these lightweight structures in terms of the mechanics in other ways, but the feathers do have that. Um, you know, I think people are looking at ways of making structural color. Um, so birds are, you know, birds are not the only example, but the feathers are one example of how you could make structural color. So there's, there's things that you could learn from the birds, I think. It's one of the things, uh, for example, for astronauts, like uh, the heat insulation is one of the, the, mm. the big issues. Like, mm -hmm. so if the feather is like provide so much insight, then why haven't we started designing like, like space suits that like, resemble? Mm. Space suits with sort of down type insulation? Is that what you're meaning? Uh, I, thought, I thought they were mostly worried about the entire spaceship, and they have sort of ceramic, almost like uh, fiberish materials that they use for that, the heat shield on, on, on the, uh, like the shuttle. But it's not, it's not based on feathers. Anyone else? Kirk, what are you doing back there? I'm learning about feathers. There you go. So my, my, my question is, if, if some, it seems in the barn owl, that's a, that's a very efficient sound collecting mechanism that ought to be available to mammals. Does, does fur offer any of the same qualities as feathers in terms of sound collection? Fur is pathetic compared to the, <laughs> compared to the feathers? Fur is pathetic. Although, I, Peko's not here, but she would tell you about otter fur and how it, how it repels water, too. But um, I don't know, I'm not aware of anything on fur that would, you know, let an animal uh, collect sound the way the feathers do on the barn owl. Are we good? Okay. 
Okay. Okay. So with, with that, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for, for listening.